All right, everybody, it's Steve with the Rogue Scholar. Today, I'm going to have my good friend, Bob Hockett, join us. And so let me go ahead and make that happen. Bob, welcome to the Rogue Scholar, my friend. Stephen, it's so great to be on with you again. I'm just, I've been so looking forward to this. Thanks so much for making time for me. It's the other way around, my friend, for sure, on this case. So <laughs> let, let me let me just jump in. So I've had you on, it was funny, I was scrolling through all the 150 plus episodes of Macro and Cheese, and I was like, oh, there's Hockett, uh, there's Hockett, uh, there's Hockett, uh, there's Hockett, there's Hockett. I was like, holy cowabunga, you make up a solid 10% of all of our um uh podcast so oh, you've been God. around you you oh, require man. no introduction <laughs> i've been loving this so much and i think we started in 2018 so we're basically i think it was early 2018 as well so i think this is maybe the beginning of our fifth year together uh, yeah yeah you know what it has been a bit hasn't it it has yeah. been a bit for sure yeah about four years well, this, wonderful Absolutely. You, you, you are my go-to guy for all things Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. You're my go-to guy, especially when it comes to understanding policy. And in particular today, we're going to talk about wildcat crypto because mm -hmm. this is something that, in my opinion, I, I don't think a lot of people understand. I, first of all, I don't think a lot of people really understand what's going on, not just in the I've invested $10 in Bitcoin gang. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the overarching space and the the political struggles that are going on and the implications that are out there for regular people as we move into this next phase of digitalization mm -hmm. of not only you know money, uh, but the concept of exchange and so forth. This, this new world that we're entering into uh, for all but the most uh, dedicated is a new place and 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 probably scary for some and and mm -hmm. probably you know very exciting for others mm -hmm. but you penned uh several papers here that coined the phrase wildcat crypto and when i saw that i said let's get bob on to talk about what wildcat crypto is and why it matters um so go ahead and give us a little insight as to what wildcat crypto even means and lay the foundations for this conversation sure yeah no, th what a great question Stephen. and, and I, I love talking about this stuff so thanks for this opportunity so essentially the the phrase wildcat crypto just sort of trades on uh, a, an important i think and very evocative and instructive uh historical analogy um, between sort of where we are uh in the crypto space or the digital currency space uh now um and where we were in the what we might call the paper currency space um, about 150 some odd years ago. Um, so, you know, probably most people aren't aware of the fact because it's a bit of a kind of a nerdy sort of fact. Um, only nerdy people are generally going to know about it. But um, a lot of people aren't aware of the fact that there was not um, a, a nationally issued paper dollar or paper currency before the 1860s. Um, there were, of course, of course minted coins uh, of the metallic sort, uh, but there was not a paper currency. Rather, the paper currencies were what were called banknotes, just uh, sort of by analogy to today's Federal Reserve notes. That's the same word note uh, in the two phrases uh, for non-accidental reasons. In essence, the form the paper currency took um, were paper bills that were issued by private sector banking institutions, none of which were regulated um, or overseen at the federal level in any serious way, but were rather instead chartered by states, right, sub-national states, and accordingly, likewise regulated by subnational states. Um, one consequence of this was that the actual value in terms of goods and services that could be purchased or commanded with these currencies, the actual values tended to fluctuate both over time and across space. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, um, in effect, the reliability of the currency was parasitic on the reliability of the bank in question, right? The issuing bank. Uh, and the reliability of the issuing bank for its part was partly a function of the reliability of the state regulatory apparatus within the state that had chartered the bank in question, right? So paper currency dollars, in other words, dollar bills 
issued by, let's say, Pilgrim Bank or Puritan Bank uh, in Salem, Massachusetts, uh, might trade at par. They might be worth a full dollar in terms of goods and services. And then by the same token, some currency issued by the, you know, uh, Pecos Bill Bank uh, down in the sort of barely settled Southwest or something uh, might trade at a discount, might basically be worth only 50 cents in terms of, say, the Puritan Bank's uh, currency, notwithstanding the fact that the bill would be denominated one dollar, right? So you had all of these different paper currencies that would sort of, you know, fluctuate in value relative to one another and even relative to the goods and services that they were used uh, to purchase. Now, this, of course, was not an altogether advantageous uh, monetary regime. Um, for one thing, of course, if you were going to purchase something at the general store and you had a number of different paper currencies uh, in your pocket, um, the merchant uh, or the sales clerk or whoever you were making the purchase from would have to consult a sort of regularly updated schedule of discounts applicable to these particular paper currencies, right? So basically you'd have to list, um, you know, Stephen is handing over $10 in Puritan bank notes, $20 in rattlesnake bank notes, you know, $6.50, uh, let's just say $6.00, um, in pirate bank or bluebeard bank notes and so forth. And then put little multiplication signs next to those nominal amounts and then apply the discount factor. Is it a 0% discount? Is it a 5%, 10%, 90% discount? You name it. And then add up or sum up those real rather than nominal values to determine how much money, so to speak, Stevens actually laid out on the counter. Now that's of course not particularly helpful when it comes to engaging in transactions as just a sort of regular part of you know, commercial activity or, or market activity. But it became an especially acute problem once the Civil War began, right? Because once the Civil War is underway, starting in um, early the early 1860s, you've got the Union having to pay soldiers, having to requisition or purchase supplies, war material, uniforms, muskets, lead, whatever. Um, and the federal government, right, has to make these purchases uh, in order to basically supply an army to enforce the continuation of the Union on the would-be seceding South. It's no way to run a war. It's no way to finance a war, uh, you might say. Furthermore, adding to the problems here, of course, was the fact that it was kind of difficult. There wasn't really a, a nicely well-settled regime through which the federal government could float its bond instruments, the various financial instruments that the Treasury would put out during the time that the war was underway. So there were three enactments that were passed by, uh, uh, well, passed by the Republican Congress. Back Republican in those days meant something rather different from what it means now. But three very important uh, enactments passed by the Republican Congress in the early 1860s and then signed into law uh, by President Lincoln, uh, which effectively put into place more or less the monetary system that we have even to this day, at least in the paper space. There was a, a Currency Act, a Legal Tender Act, and a National Bank Act. And in effect, what these enactments did was for the first time to provide for a, a, a network of nationally chartered banks, which would then issue national notes, national basically paper currency notes. Um, the sort of slang term for these things was the greenback. And that's the same green that you find to this day uh, in the green dollar bill. Um, and it established a new office within the Treasury Department, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which is still one of our primary, one of our three primary federal banking regulators to this day. And it's a really, you know, it's, you can sort of see a clue both as to what our monetary history is and as to the relation between a sovereign authority on the one hand a bank on the other hand, and money on the third hand, even in the name of that regulator, right? People might think, well, why is a bank regulator called the comptroller of the currency? Well, the word comptroller is simply an older form of English for the word controller. So the Treasury Department was controlling the national currency uh, through the office of the comptroller, which also was the authority that chartered 
uh, these new nationally chartered banks, this network of banks. So you can almost think of this as having as, as a sort of a franchise arrangement that we developed uh, and put into place in the 1860s. You can sort of think of the chartering authority, the comptroller of the currency as the McDonald's Corporation. You can think of the national banks uh, as the individual McDonald's uh, stores, so to speak, or restaurants with the golden arches. Um, and in effect, what the franchisor, the comptroller does is what any franchisor does, and that is to control the quality of the product that the franchisees disseminate, in this case, the dollar. And they control the quality, uh, basically by controlling the quality of the banks themselves, i.e. regulating them. Um, and that's essentially the regime we have to this day with the wrinkle that we added a central bank to the mix, the Fed, 50 years later, um, and gave it the sort of jurisdiction over or the responsibility of issuing uh, the currency. But it still works closely in tandem with the Treasury Department and the uh, Comptroller. Now, the reason that it seems to me that that's an interesting sort of history uh, to sort of understand in the present, in the, in, the, in the space of crypto, is that in a sense, we're in the same stage where crypto development is concerned right now, as we were where paper currency was concerned before those three enactments of the 1860s, right? You've got all of these private issuers of so-called cryptocurrencies, one consequence, and there's a lot of ambiguity, of course, as to how and whether uh, and in what ways and to what degree any of these particular issuers are to be regulated or are regulated at this point. It's not even altogether clear what regulator, if any, is the right one to exercise jurisdiction over them. That's still being sort of worked out. But basically, one consequence of this regulatory uncertainty and this kind of Tower of Babel's worth of private sector issuers is you've got all of these cryptocurrencies that fluctuate in value relative to one another and that fluctuate in value relative to goods and services or things that they might purchase over time. So it's a kind of crazy polyglot system without any kind of uniformity and without any kind of sovereign backing or sovereign um, uh, endorsement, uh, let's say. There's no franchisor uh, in short. There's no sort of franchise arrangement. And yet a currency uh, is clearly moving uh, in the digital and even the cryptographic direction for a couple of reasons, um, at least two legitimate reasons, we might say, and then uh, a number of illegitimate or you know maybe misguided or unfortunate reasons, right? The legitimate motives or reasons, I think, include at least the following two. One is that privacy is a thing, right? I mean, we do care about privacy, uh, and we do, I think, with good reason, want to be able to protect the privacy of certain kinds of transaction, at least up to a certain amount. And cryptographic protections are a nice, straightforward, easy way to do that. Secondly, and perhaps most importantly of all, or even at least as important, let's say, uh, as the sort of privacy protection reasons, there just is the superiority in terms of clearing and settling of transactions offered by certain digital currencies or electronically based currencies that currencies that basically that basic that basically Stephen now by say writing a check or sending you the electronic equivalent your bank will not allow you to access the funds that I've transferred to you until a number of basically steps have been gone through between your bank and my bank so that everything can be sort of assured to be on the up and up. Uh, and so sometimes there are lag times, there are delays between my making a payment to you on the one hand and that payment's actual clearing and hence the transaction's actual settling on the other hand. So the phrase of art that we use for what we desire, what we would prefer in a case like this is so-called real time clearing and settling. And the payment platforms on which uh, digital currencies are based offer the prospect of real-time clearing and settling, which is a, a faster and more efficient, you might say, payments system. Um, and so there's a kind of payment system advantage and a privacy advantage offered by these currencies. And for that reason, central banks worldwide, sovereigns worldwide, are growingly interested in the prospect of digitizing 
their national paper currencies. And a number of countries are fairly far along on this. You're probably aware of the fact that Sweden um, launched uh, an actual trial of its so-called e-krona, uh, which is mm. or e-krona, um, which is a, a digital version of the Swedish krona, um, about two years ago in February of 2020. China, of right. course, is going full board um, on this. A number of other countries uh, as well. A number of African countries have jumped into this quite quickly because it offers the prospect of basically leapfrogging directly to universal banking for everybody on their iPhones or other smart devices rather than having to go through the stage of brick and mortar bank branches in the way that we had to do. Um, so there's a lot of movement here. The Fed, as usual, is one of the slower moving um, uh, central banks. But as you know, just last week, they finally put out an official white paper uh, about this. And as it happens right after you and I talk today, uh, I'm going to be on the phone with a number of Fed colleagues with whom I've been working for a few years now on developing um, a Fed issued digital currency. So in effect, we oh, have okay. a kind of movement in this direction right now. And I think one way to view it is effectively as the sort of digital equivalent of the move that we made in the 1860s from you know wildcat paper to sovereign issued paper, and now from wildcat issued crypto uh, to sovereign issued digital currencies. Uh, or so-called CBDCs, central bank issued digital currencies. So that's so kind of where we are. This, how, how does this, you know, delineate between what you see with the external, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, all these different, you know, Dogecoin, etc. How yeah. do we see those <laughs> and this CBDC? I think you said yeah. over yeah. here. How, how do we? I mean, can they work together or are they going to always remain apart? What, what, what is the focus here? Yeah. So I think what's likely to happen, if you'll pardon a pun, um, is that Bitcoin is likely to become a bit player. Right. Um, and likewise, some of the other better known uh, digital currencies that are currently on offer will become sort of smaller or they will play a much smaller role than they're playing now, but some of them might very well persist. Um, a lot of them though, a whole lot of them, it seems to me are likely to disappear or to sort of be phased out. You can kind of anticipate some of what's likely to happen, I think, by looking at what happens to the so-called wildcat banknotes, the paper banknotes um, in the after the 1860s, right? So these things gradually, basically diminished in their importance and in the, the widespreadness of their use. To some extent, this was encouraged by the federal government itself, which began to tax the use of those currencies. But this was in effect just to drive final nails in a coffin that had already been built and whose you know sort of lid was already beginning to close because people saw the proverbial writing on the wall that right, the most reliable and the most widely usable, the most uniformly valuable currency was of course going to be that which was issued by and backed by that authority that had sovereign jurisdiction over the entirety of the national market. And I think the same thing more or less is going to happen in the crypto space. Another thing maybe worth noting, uh, and this offers us a chance to kind of step back for a moment and, and take a quick look at what I was calling some of the illicit or misguided reasons for people's um, getting into crypto these days. One reason, a, a sort of a less honorable, you might say, or less, um, publicly vindicatable reason that some people are interested in various forms of cryptocurrency is because the particular privacy that it offers is a kind of privacy that's favored not just by people like you and me who have ordinary expectations of privacy, but also by people who actually need to be private lest they be found to be violating or committing various felonies, right, that might land them in jail. So if you were financing illegal trades of various kinds, like say human trafficking, or if you're financing terrorist activity or various other forms of criminal activity, you love 
crypto, of course, because you're cryptographically protecting your identity and keeping the authorities um, from learning of your existence or of your activities. Um, and, you know, there's that will continue to be a motive and that will continue then to be a reason that some people will try to use various forms of crypto and various people will continue to try to offer uh, such forms of currency. But the fact is that now, you know, once we have legit uh, cryptocurrencies or legit digital currencies um, on offer, um, people's continuing to use the non-public versions of this will at the very least be flying yellow flags over themselves, right? They will be <laughs> inviting the scrutiny of regulators. And in some cases, um, they will pass that scrutiny in the sense that when inquiries are made uh, as to what these transactions were all about, they'll have perfectly good explanations that are perfectly legal and above board. But others, of course, uh, will not be able to uh, make such explanations. And in effect, they'll be driven further underground in the way that they were before uh, crypto uh, sort of uh, came along. So my guess to sort of sum up all of that long-winded uh, reply <laughs> is to say that they will continue, some of them will, I think, continue to play bit parts um, and have legitimate uses, but that as, as, per, as sort of portions of or percentages of total market activity, transactions in these currencies will be greatly, greatly diminished. There'll be a, a tiny piece of the full panoply of transaction activity that will be going on. So, so you got places like China that are, in essence, banning crypto. Uh, yeah. Russia, I believe, has even taken a fairly harsh uh, stance on crypto. But then you got yeah. places that are like Iran or maybe some of the global south that have been directly mm -hmm. impacted by sanctions and other uh, meddling by our CIA and other yeah. other groups, perhaps, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So they're, you know, assuming that not all uh, countries that engage in use of crypto are nefarious, maybe they just are not helping out with markets uh, for the U.S. I mean, what do you see as a a long view of of the global South and these other countries that have been targeted? Uh, by U.S. sanctions in terms of mm -hmm. using uh, crypto in this particular mm -hmm. space? Because it seems like this is a, a very good use case, if you will, both for and against uh, this particular uh, technology. Yeah, I think that's that's characteristically quite insightful, Stephen. I think in you know, sort of globally speaking, um, I think once again, we can kind of partition um, the class of crypto uses into perfectly honorable, legitimate um, reasons or motives uh, on the one hand, and some that are perhaps a bit less so uh, on the other. To start with the legitimate ones or the, the, the salutary or even honorable and laudable and I think you know worthy of support reasons, um, there are a lot of countries that would like to be um, a little bit freer than they are now of dollar hegemony uh, in the global financial uh, system and in the global monetary uh, system. And you could very well, I could very well imagine, and indeed I've even been helping to sort of design a kind of a template for a particular kind of circumstance whereby you might have a number of countries that might basically unify or sort of ally together to form trading blocks and hence current and, and sort of associated currency blocks that might very well be digitized, right? Digital currency blocks that are sort of free of the dollar um, and that enable, and if, if enough countries, if there's enough sort of diversity of economy types and climate types that affect economy types um, among the nations that form such blocks, you could in effect have something that partly or somewhat replicates uh, or sort of recreates, in effect, all of the diversification advantages that that set of states that called themselves a single country, the United States, uh, in North America enjoyed in order to, you know, in the establishment of a unified and diversified economy that could then share a, a currency. You might imagine some such measures of that kind being taken, partly because it's an easier way to do this. Those motives and reasons um, have been there for a long, long time, but it was a lot harder to effectuate, you know, a sort of alternative trading block and an alternative 
currency block to that that's dominated by the U.S. when currencies were primarily physical, right? When they were primarily metal or paper uh, or some combination of both, or even when they were digital, but digital in a manner that was sort of parasitic on paper or metal. Um, if um, you can kind of work out the details um, um, expeditiously, you can imagine a group of countries now being able to form a kind of trading cum monetary block that enjoys the sort of, again, economy diversification benefits of something like the United States, um, and that is able to, to function fairly well because it's electronically based, even blockchain based to say. That would be, I think that's a kind of a promising uh, and, and sort of a lovely uh, prospect that's ahead of us now. Um, on the other hand, uh, sort of in parallel with that, it's very easy to imagine crypto equivalents of the current, you know, sort of uh, scourge of so-called offshore financial centers, um, places like the Cayman Islands, uh, places like the Channel Islands off of the coast of the UK, which are places that not only host illicit activity and tax evasion and things of that sort, but are also places where um, indigenous populations are basically treated like a local class of serfs by the primarily you know, Western or industrialized country people who then live in resort hotels and so forth on those islands. Um, indeed, it's, you know, it, it almost, I, I don't want to, I don't want to sort of fork, I don't want to stack the deck on this because it's still not clear, but there is some reason to worry that El Salvador right now might be, or that its chief executive at least, might be trying to position itself as a kind of crypto Cayman, a kind of Cayman for crypto, um, given that chief executives, uh, former business associations and apparently ongoing business connections and some of the uh, reasons that he's stated for wanting to make uh, Bitcoin the quote unquote official currency of El Salvador, there might be some reason to worry about things like that. Um, and, you know, it, there might also be reason to worry that, it, that they would persist because as you know, um, global finance regulatory authorities, while they constantly, you know, sort of express consternation about all of these offshore finance havens, they never do anything actually to shut them down. You know, it's an ongoing scandal <laughs> has been for decades, right? So, you know, you can even imagine those havens themselves simply, you know, cryptifying um, and sort of, you know, adding to their business lines, you know, sort of the housing or basing of, of, of various illicit cryptocurrencies or at least cryptocurrencies that are favored by um, uh, illicit actors. Um, so that kind of thing might happen or continue as well. But my guess would be that even if that's the case, that too will be a, sort of a bit playing um, uh, sort of uh, set of actors, um, whereas where the main action will be, will be among the global central banks, just as is as the case now with uh, so-called paper currencies. So if you look across the 50 states, obviously we have many needs at a state mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. to be able to fund initiatives. And we've mm -hmm. had various moments throughout the pandemic and other times where they've opened up different avenues at the fed to fund and finance municipal projects and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I've seen obviously the push in the United States, uh, for, you know, cryptocurrency in general, mm -hmm. what do you see? I know we've talked uh, extensively with various people within our, our circles about complementary currencies and things like that. But in this particular sense, uh, are, are we talking about each individual having in essence an account at the Fed? Are we talking about P the states themselves having a, a digital line or is this indistinguishable of the paper currency and regular digital banknotes? Is this just a, a medium, if you will, that this would exist in? It doesn't really change the fact that it's still an inch or a pound or a dollar. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how does this play out in that space? Another really fantastic and visionary, if I might put it that way, Steve, uh, Stephen, question. Um, really fantastic. So um, there are many possibilities here that are all of them uh, wonderful, right? So maybe the way to sort of enter into this is to recall this, um, this observation I made a moment ago about how uh, some countries in particular, notably on the eastern uh, coast of, of, of Africa, uh, are going to uh, central bank issued digital currencies 
straight away as a way of leapfrogging big, uh, brick and mortar uh, banking. Um, to elaborate a little bit more on that, the cool thing about those particular plans is that in effect, everybody's phone or smart device becomes their bank, right? The digital wallet in effect becomes at least the bank account. And if you have then some central government entity or agency that is administering the system, then in effect, what you have is citizen central banking done via smartphone, right? Now, there's no reason that we can't do the same thing here in the US, and there is indeed every reason to do it in the US, and indeed we even could have begun doing it as early as 1917 when Fedwire was instituted, which is essentially a national electronic payment system. But because it kind of blows people's minds to imagine citizen central banking, simply because they're so used to central banks basically being at the center of banking systems where their only counterparties are private sector banks, it sounds kind of too wacky, too crazy or whatever, but it's not. And it's actually much more feasible now, even than it would have been in 1917. Um, so as a general prop, to start with a general proposition, there's simply no reason any longer not to have direct citizen central banking where people's digital wallets are de facto central bank bank accounts, right? Both transaction accounts and savings accounts, right? That's the first point. Second point is while we might think of this generically as citizen central banking, it doesn't necessarily have to be done via or through the nation's central bank. And in fact, it doesn't even have to be done at the national level. It can be started locally or at the state level and then move to the federal level. And if it moves to the federal level, it can then be done either through treasury or through the Fed. Um, now on this, I'll just mention a couple of papers that people might find interesting, and then I'll, I'll give the sort of short playing versions. If anybody just Googles my name on the one hand, and then um, adds to that, do a Boolean, you know, my name and, and then it could be, you could say digital dollars, um, inclusive value ledger, IVL, or uh, treasury, uh, treasury accounts, or um, digital greenbacks would be another another possibility. If you Google any of those phrases in my name, you'll find a whole bunch of different papers um, that I've been putting out over the last three, four years to sort of show the various ways in which this can be done, right? So as you might know, I think you and I might have talked about this, Stephen, uh, the New York State Legislature, both the Assembly and the Senate, have bills before them that I drafted back in 2019 called the, New, uh, the, the Empire State Inclusive Value Establishment and Administration Act. And essentially what this would do would be to create or establish a system of digital wallets available to any resident of the state of New York and any business uh, doing business in the state of New York. And basically anybody on the system would be able to transact directly with one another via the connections between their digital wallets. And then the state of New York, in turn, which confers all manner of dollar-denominated benefit on people um, in the form of various sorts of uh, social welfare-type programs, but also lots of other benefits for which people uh, qualify, the state would then pay people in that form. And then you could use your wallet, which would then receive those credits, to make payments to other people or entities in the state when you wanted to, or and it would also be required any state and any bank, any private sector bank operating in the state of New York would have to allow for the conversion of these digital dollars in digital wallets into paper dollars if they want to, right? They'd be able to go to an ATM in effect and withdraw cash if they wanted to do that as well. That's very easy to do at the state level. And you could even do it at the local level if you had enough personnel who are sort of, who kind of are savvy enough to sort of know how to make this kind of thing work. My guess would be, uh, my, my guess is that New York probably will end up doing this fairly soon. And if it does, what we have in effect is the beginnings of a kind of public, digital public bank uh, in the state of New York. Um, I'm working on a similar plan for the state of California and a number of other states. And then as, as I think you know, Stephen, I've got a, a similar plans before uh, US Congress right now, various Congress members, believe it or not, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, are interested in this. And we might then, in consequence, be able to do something pretty quickly, starting at Treasury and then migrating the system over to the Fed. 
the way the treasury method would work, and this is the digital greenbacks plan, is basically as follows. You might, you probably already know this, Stephen, but some of your listeners or viewers might not. Anybody in the country right now can open an account with the U.S. Treasury Department. It's called Treasury Direct, and anybody interested in this, I would encourage just to Google, just Google Treasury Direct, and the very first link that'll come up is the Treasury Direct site. And what you can do is you can purchase with dollars various treasury securities, notes, bills, bonds, and maintain an account at treasury in this way. The only problem with this is that you also have to have a private sector bank account in which you hold dollars that you then use to purchase those securities. So what I, I had kind of got this goofy idea back in late 2019, early 2020, what if we did the following? What if we just did made two tweaks to Treasury Direct? First, we make it digital wallet accessible, digital wallet usable, so people can use their, their smartphones or smart devices or whatever uh, to access a Treasury Direct and basically to bank through Treasury Direct on their phones. And second, we enable people to hold dollars in those Treasury Direct accounts. In other words, as you know, Treasury, Treasury instruments are basically federal, they're just sovereign issuances, right? But so is the paper dollar, right? So you've got Federal Reserve notes, and then you've got Treasury notes. You've got Treasury bills, and you've got dollar bills. What if we said, okay, the other kind of note or bill, namely the dollar bill or the Federal Reserve note, can also be held in a Treasury direct account so that you, Stephen, don't have to have a separate private sector bank account to be dealing in your Treasury direct account? What if, furthermore, again, we enable you to do all of your transacting of this sort with Treasury direct on a smart device? And then finally, if we also add horizontal connectivity, between people's phone-based Treasury Direct accounts rather than just the vertical, vertical connectivity that you have now between yourself and the Treasury Department. Well, this would basically be a digitization of the original Treasury greenbacks of the 1860s, but using mm -hmm. smart devices. So I could now make a payment to you, Stephen, into your Treasury Direct account from my Treasury Direct account in dollars, right, in legal tender, simply using our smart devices, our phones, our laptops, our iPads, or even our iPods for that matter, any smart device. Now I contacted both uh, the relevant treasury officials and people at US Digital Service, which is the federal agency that basically does technical upgrades of various uh, infra various federal infrastructures um, back in early 2020, because I thought if we could do this quickly, this could even be the method by which the, um, the, the government sends out the relief checks during the worst of the pandemic. And, tr and, and, and believe it or not, um, the digital, uh, basically US Digital Service said, we could do this in about three months, right? It would only take a few months wow. to add, right? To digitize and then to add the horizontal connectivity. And this would basically be federal level public banking, right? And what you could do is, you know, it, sure, it takes, it might take a while to integrate this apparatus into the apparatus of Fed monetary policy. So we could start smallish by saying, okay, we'll place a limit on how much you can keep in your treasury direct account, maybe no more than a thousand or 2000 or $3,000, which is enough for most of us to do, you know, day-to-day -day transacting. Indeed, it's more than enough for most of our day-to-day -day transacting. And then let the Fed and the treasury work together on sort of gradually, you know, figuring out how to, in a seamless and, and non-disruptive way, to integrate this new infrastructure into the already existing infrastructure of Fed monetary policy. And then maybe you could ultimately migrate the system over to the Fed altogether, or you could keep it under treasury jurisdiction, but simply have treasury and Fed coordinating the, uh, the, the sort of administration of this system. Well, then again, you would have citizen central banking done through our treasury department or through our Fed, our central bank, or through both together acting kind of jointly. And note what this would do. There would be no problem of the unbanked anymore because while 25% of Americans are unbanked or underbanked, 
only 5% lack smart de devices. 95% of people here in the US have some form of smart device or another. So you, you eliminate the problem of the so-called unbanked. Monetary policy as conducted by the Fed would be much more seamless and efficient than it is now. Now, if the Fed wants to sort of stimulate, it basically has to make money cheap to banks and then hope that the banks will make money cheaply available to you, Stephen, or to me, Bob. Um, but instead, it could just directly credit our accounts to stimulate. If it offered interest on those accounts, it could adjust the interest rate to act in a more fine-tuned way to adjust the money supply. If it worries that things are overheating, it could simply raise the interest payments that we receive on our digital wallet accounts so that we save a little bit more than we might otherwise do because we're earning higher returns. And then if it wanted to stimulate more spending activity or what have you, it could either lower those rates or it could go further by actually just putting money into our accounts just directly, as it did in a certain sense via the medium of paper checks back in March of 2020. All right. So it would be, you know, just basically the, the, the analogy that I find helpful here is you and I are old enough to remember when automobiles had carburetors rather than fuel injection, <laughs> right? Um, and the problem, you know, carburetors. They worked, but they're not altogether efficient because, of course, it's one thing feeding the fuel and air mix to all of the distinct cylinders of the car. So there's a lot of waste. There's a lot of there's a possibility of flooding the engine and so forth. Um, but fuel injection, of course, is much more sort of fine tuned, much more about getting precisely the right mix individually into each distinct cylinder in the engine. Um, of course, soon, hopefully, we won't even have internal combustion <laughs> engines. But for the time being, while we still have them, if we draw the distinction between carburetors and fuel injection, you might sort of say this would be a kind of fuel injection style of monetary policy now made available to us rather than the kind of sloppy, messy, indirect, pushing on a string carburetor style of monetary policy that we're stuck with now. Yeah. So this, and, and I want to wrap this up because we're, we're coming to an end, but this is an amazing thing. Cause so from what I'm seeing now, for those people who really, really, really detest the private bank world, here's an opportunity to really, really kind of cut them right out of the mix. Yeah. Also for those people who think monetary policy has some value to society right now, other than creating inflation through interest rates. Now, all of a sudden you have real practicable monetary policy that can be in near real time uh, to adjust according to circumstances beyond uh, the normal control of the long arc of passing legislation and so forth. But then also yeah. this kind of speaks directly to a direct kind of a democratic control of our currency at an, a whole different level. Um, yeah. let, let me let you close us out because we, we are at that time. So go ahead and give us our final word here, sir. Yeah, well, sure. Thanks so much. Yeah. So, I mean, the final point, and this is sort of captured even in the title of um, one of the papers I sort of alluded to earlier, just called The Democratic Digital Dollar. Um, it really is a way of largely democratizing monetary policy. It's even a way of democratizing to a certain extent, even fiscal policy, right? Because by having the sort of fuel injection uh, sort of infrastructure uh, in place, you've got both the Fed and the Treasury able to sort of fine tune or sort of very carefully direct where federal funds and federal flows are going to go. So for example, if inflationary problems such as they are, they're of course overblown and they are indeed transitory, but insofar as there are any, they're going to be, I think it's fairly easy to show right now even, that they're largely caused by speculation on the part of hedge funds and others using cheap Fed money to speculate on commodity markets, right? On fuel markets and foodstuffs markets and so forth. Um, and I'm always, you know, kind of uh, popping off about how we really ought to be a bit more fine tuned and a little bit more sort of specific in our allocations when it comes to sort of monetary easing. And we can also do the same or be the same way when it comes to monetary tightening so that we're not using the blunt instruments that we're using now, right? If the Fed raises rates, I don't think it actually will, but if it were to raise rates, in March, that's going to affect everybody adversely. It's in effect going to kill the patient, right? But you can much more, in a much more fine-tuned way, tap down inflationary pressures in places where they are by having the Fed say, 
short sell the the entity or the the um, the items in question you can have the fed go long in things where you want actually to put a floor under prices or boost prices all of that is doable even now but it would be especially easy to do if we had this sort of fuel injection money flow system of the kind that you and i are talking about right now and i'm sort of thinking that if it were easier to effectuate by dint of the wiring of the plumbing so to speak that might also make it a little bit more thinkable uh, to our public officials who might then act in ways that are uh, our monetary officials might act in ways that are more directly responsive to the needs and the cares of the population as a whole rather than the needs of what who are currently their constituents which are basically the member banks right so you know this is a long term kind of cultural effect and political effect, uh, maybe even a political mindset or epistemic effect that I'm thinking about here. But if we if we had the central bank and the treasury gradually changing their mindset where they're thinking of the citizenry as their direct clientele, because the citizenry own the wallets into which money is deposited and out of which money is being paid. If we had that happen instead of what we currently have, which is where they're thinking of the Wall Street banks as their primary clients, and of everybody else as at best their secondary clients via the middlemen of the banks, you're going to have a kind of a, a, a democratization in a sense of the very mindset of the monetary policy makers and the monetary policy effectuators. And you're also going to expand the menu of possible policies that will be on the political agenda uh, every electoral season. Uh, so I think this will be quite transformative, both in the short run and even in a bigger way in the longer run, if we do this. And I'm guessing we will. Bob, this is amazing. As always, there's not enough time to have these great conversations. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of The Rogue Scholar. Um, <laughs> these lunchtime breaks, we're running up against it because in seven minutes, I got to be live back in the other world. Oh, so with that, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. And folks, thank you so much for joining us. Remember, we start at noon, guys and gals. So if you want to catch it from the beginning, Set your alarms, get here at noon. We'll see you next time, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. I'm Steve Grumman, the Rogue Scholar, with my guest, Bob Hockett. Have a great day, everybody. We're out of here. Thank you so much, Stephen. You got it, man. Yeah.